Hey, welcome everybody to 10 Minute Trumpet Tips. I'm your host, Bobby Medina, and today we got a special guest artist, uh, my very dear friend, Paul Barron, who's one of today's most highly sought after and uh, highly respected uh, leading commercial player. This guy plays all kinds of styles. He's played with so many people, it's impossible to list them all. Aerosmith, Natalie Cole, uh, we've done shows together, many shows, he and I, uh, Wayne Newton, Frankie Valley, and the uh, Four Tops, Temptations. He also has toured for a number of years now with uh, Disney musicals and other national touring shows. And I think currently you're with uh, Disney's Frozen, right? That's right, yeah. So you're always traveling, traveling all over, all over the place, sometimes different countries. And uh, I'm, you know, what I'm kind of curious about, Paul, is how does a guy like you that's playing, I mean, you're on the road for months, right? Months out of the yes. year, most of the year. Sometimes years. <laughs> it feels like that, I'm sure. Um, so how does a guy like you, you know, remain really consistent? You know, what goes into your, you know, your routine, your maintenance, because you're playing day after day after day. I mean, I know that can get really hard, and it, I think everybody here would love to learn a little bit more about what you personally do to keep your, your chops going and and, uh, and maintain. Sure. Well, a lot of it is uh, just trying to figure out the needs of the show, uh, the physical demands, musical demands, of course. Um, but a lot of it is pacing and just trying to figure out when to step on the gas, when to ease off a little bit. Um, how much you can push, uh, and most importantly, maybe, is where that line is that you should never cross. Don't push past that, that point. Um, and I mean this in um, effort level, uh, your exertion, uh, but also volume. Um, something that I've talked with uh, other players about is, is try to figure out what your maximum volume is that you can, you can play, and then figure out where the 85% mark of that is. Like take one step back, a little less volume, but with the same intensity and musical integrity and equipment um, that you can generate, but with 15% uh, left over in the spare tank. Well, so in other trumpet, words, don't push it too hard. Yeah, and exactly. And the trumpet's really loud in the first place. So I think a lot of us feel like I got to really blow to get your sound up. But really, when you start listening for balance and stuff, I mean, we're at the top of the hierarchy when it comes to brilliance and volume, you know, so we can back off, right? Absolutely. And I think in some cases, we end up being our own worst enemy in that, as you said, the trumpet is a loud instrument anyway. It projects so well. Um, but I've been in many situations and probably will be again. Uh, that I have to remind myself over and over to trust the sound will carry, it'll project, um, even though we might not be able to hear ourselves as much as we do uh, behind the bell. Just trust physically if you're doing the right things and it feels correct and uh, it feels like you're blowing with enough intensity and, and everything, that it is projecting out there and, uh, and getting picked up by the microphone as well. Well, one of the things I know I've had issues with at times, and I'm, you're, you're probably a master at this, it's really trying to figure out what the room is like. Because like when I'm here at my home and I'm practicing, I got this beautiful, perfect situation. I mean, it's nice and reverberant. I, I know Doc Severance that I've read, I've seen interviews with him, and he's, he says, I always look for a... Uh, a stairwell somewhere in a building, in a concrete building, so I can really hear things reverberate. But, you know, when you're playing in a pit or sometimes we're playing in different types of rooms, it's dead. And when you don't hear anything coming back from you, how do you, how do you uh, work that? That's difficult. It, it comes down to a, a level of trust, I guess. Um, and it's taken many, many years and a lot of bruised chops to, to try and figure this out. Um, that you, you, I suppose Bobby Shu used to talk about um, 
you know, roll your lips and, and, and feel what it, with the sensation of having great feeling chops or, or at least good feeling chops and, and try and internalize that and, and memorize that and be able to recreate it. Even if we can't hear ourselves well enough, if it feels correct and you know that you're blowing the right way, you just have to sort of let it go and trust that it's actually getting out there. Um, it's a lot easier said than done. That's for sure. And I'm certainly guilty of overblowing too often if I can't hear myself well enough. So uh, part yeah, of the Bob luxury. Knew, uh, sorry to interrupt. Bob no, it's okay. had, a, had a thing that he taught me many years ago. I, I was a student of his when I was a kid. And uh, one of the things he had talked about, he came to uh, an idea one time. He used to play on the Don, Don Kirshner rock concert shows. He was in the house band. And he said it was so loud, he could never hear himself, and he started blowing himself out. So as a result, he came up with this exercise where you would stuff cotton balls in your ear, and you would play these legato quarter notes, starting at like triple P to triple F, and then back down to triple T, so you could feel what it feels like to play at all volume, but not hear it, hear it outside you. So I guess it's like you're talking, it's a way of sort of internalizing this feeling. Absolutely. And that's a great uh, point to bring up too, that, uh, you know, because I'm doing this kind of work all the time and I'm using in-ear monitors and, um, and I've had a chance to get used to playing in that kind of situation, I, I now can trust myself more, but I wish I had, uh, either seen or, or heard Bobby talk about that um, and, and then been smart enough to actually practice as a younger player with the earplugs in or the ball, whatever, to start learning how to trust my body uh, that it actually getting out. It took me many decades after probably a, other people figured it out for me to finally, uh, you know, get a handle on it and, and trust that I'm doing if I'm doing things physically correct and it feels right, then it is right. And the sound is getting out there. Well, let me ask you this, because this is just really off the cuff right now, but one sure. of the things that I've had happen to me personally, and this comes from playing on really loud, uh, in loud sort of rock horn section situations, but it can happen to you in any kind of a situation. I mean, classical musicians get it. Uh, Symphony directors get it, uh, and, and we get it as we age a little bit, and that's hearing loss. And sure. so I have um, some, a little bit of hearing loss, uh, more in one ear than the other, and one of my ears is particularly sensitive now, so I have to kind of baby it a little bit and sometimes play with, uh, with earplugs in and stuff. Have you had any experience with that personally? Absolutely. I, I've had tinnitus, I don't know, for how many years. Could be coming on about 20 years. And at first, it's very disconcerting and, and uh, distracting, especially you're trying to go to sleep and you're hearing this constant um, white noise or, or high-pitched hum that goes on. And it just won't go away and it can drive you crazy. Um, and then I, I read or somebody told me or something, you kind of acknowledge it, maybe not embrace it, but acknowledge that it's there um, and know that you can't get rid of it. It's just going to be part of you. And then it, it sort of sinks back into the background a little bit further. And, and so it doesn't bother you quite as much. But yeah, I've had that for maybe 20 years. And the same kind of thing. I have one year that's particularly sensitive. And um, I, I have had my hearing tested a couple of times and what they've found or what they've told me is that one ear, the sensitive one, um, although there is some hearing loss, mostly what it is is that the threshold of pain um, starts earlier for, for some of us. Maybe that's the case for you as well mm -hmm. in that when they're starting the hearing test with certain frequencies and a very low decibel level, you know, it doesn't hurt at all, but then as they start turning it up louder and louder and louder, where I go, you know, stop, it's starting to hurt, um, is much sooner than maybe a lot of other people that aren't in the business of right. using their ears like we do. Mm -hmm. 
So same kind of thing as I'll, I'll put in earplugs to help save that one ear from, from being beat up too much. But it also yeah. helps uh, just to, to feel that vibration or hear that vibration in your head. Um, you know, like Bobby Shu was talking with the cotton balls yeah. so that you can start internalizing it. Sometimes for me, I've been playing on some really loud gigs and my ears are a little beat up. And when I go home to practice or when I practice the following day or when I warm up or whatever, I got to have those earplugs in just to keep, you know, keep, keep it from hurting, which is, I guess it's partially a sign of aging as well. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in this group that can, that can probably relate to that. Sure. And just so I, everybody knows out in the group, you guys can feel free to ask uh, questions to Paul or to myself about some of these things, if you'd like. Yes, please. Uh, on the string. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll end with another little bit, because uh, I was starting to talk to you about your routine and your, and your maintenance, but you're the author of two great books uh, under the brand name Trumpet Voluntarily, which I think is really clever. And uh, there's a lot of great information in those. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what each book is about? Sure. Well, the first book came around uh, because a good friend of mine uh, who was a publisher with a small company uh, read some articles published at the time. And he just suggested, you know, that's the start of a really good book. Why don't you try and expand that and, and see what happens. And, and I did. Um, fortunately, it was a, a cold winter and I was in Cincinnati at the time. So uh, there wasn't much uh, appeal to get outside and do my normal, you know, walking routine. Yeah. So I was inside a lot and just, I'd finish the show and I'd go back home and, um, or back to the hotel and crack a beer and I'd, I'd write you know, a few hundred words or something and go to sleep and get up the next day. And with my coffee, I'd write a few hundred more words. And pretty soon there was, I don't know how many chapters, 22 chapters or something. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the whole premise of that book, um, the subtitle being a holistic approach to maximizing practice through efficiency. So it was my way of putting down in words things that I'd learned over many years being in the trenches and working, as you said, mm -hmm. you know, long running shows and, and just learning about the physical demands and how to, to wake up the next day and be able to do it all again in the next month and the next year and so on. And, and so I came up with all of these, there's a bunch of anecdotes in there, also exercises that I touch on, but mostly what it's doing is, trying to teach people more aware of what their body and feed it with the exercises um, how to clean every day uh so we're experiencing some uh some kind of delay here why don't you say that one more time what you just sure said? Yeah, the last thing is that um, I'm trying to teach people through that book, listen, listen to their child and uh, do the to like wipe the slate clean ops so that you can start every day uh, fresh again and, and uh, be able to recreate that same really good performance on a consistent level every single day. So that's the first book. Yeah, that's the one where you have like the morning after routine and all that. Exactly. Very, very cool. And now what's the second book? What's the premise of that? Well, the second book came out of, uh, and, and there was never a, an intent to write uh, this book, but I, I heard from people literally all over the world. I had people in Uganda and New Zealand and Tokyo, uh, all over the world saying, hey, well, I like the idea of your morning after warm up and I can talk about any of these things maybe in another episode I I suppose um, so there's three different warm-ups the morning uh, which, uh, having played a heavy schedule after week after week and how to as I said slate clean to start with chops every day um, the the uh, there's another warm-up 
that I call gig day warm up. So that presumes that you're not totally beat up. It's fine, but you have to do a good routine to remain uh, consistent um, and playing efficiently every single day. So that's a way to set things up. It's about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and I do that sort of late morning, early afternoon. Uh, and then the third warm up, this came from doing a lot of adjudicating at uh, high school jazz festivals and so on, where I would walk up and down the hallways and hear these screaming trumpet notes coming out of the practice rooms. And then they'd come onto stage and they had nothing, nothing left. And I realized I was really guilty of leaving all the best notes in the practice room and not bringing them out to stage. So that third warm up is a way to, to teach people, including and remind myself as well, to just warm up enough that we got things going, air is going, the, the sound is working, the chops are vibrating efficiently, and then put the horn away and save all the best notes for the show that night. Um, so, so those are the three warm-ups, and they're comprehensively entirely written out now. Um, and there's explanations as to why I do them in a certain uh, way or why I do it at a certain time of day uh, or for what purpose, like the morning after. What's the purpose of that? You know, it's to, to again, wipe that slate clean. Right, right. So that's what the, the uh, I can, I even have it right here. Trumpet voluntarily. Yeah, Oops. wonderful. Got a little bit of a, a glare there, but uh, the and brand we, name that comes from my uh, my wife. She was sending me a whole bunch of texts while I was sitting in the pit doing newsies uh, way back, and uh, I wasn't supposed to be using a cell phone, but there I am with it up on my music stand, and I'm scrolling through, and I see trumpet voluntarily. I can't use that because I thought trumpet voluntary. It's been Not done. Right. right. But then I read it a little closer and I thought, well, that's a great idea because it immediately drew my eyes to it. Maybe it will for other people too. Well, I think anybody in this group would definitely benefit from it. I know I work out of it uh, on a regular basis. It's one of those rotating books that goes through mine, uh, through my list. And, and we can get that. If, if people are interested in it, they can go to qpress.ca, right? That's correct, yes. CA for Canada, if that helps people remember. Q, just the letter Q, press, dot CA. Okay, well, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's end our 10-minute trumpet tips right there. Thanks so much for being on. And because we're in the situation we're in, I'm going to have to give you an elbow to say goodbye. There you go. Sign off. Thanks so much for being <laughs> part of this. All right, thank you, Bob. All right, bye-bye, Paul. Bye.